My name is Gosia Konverska. I um, work for Wolfram Research, and yes, this is a joint talk. Uh, this is uh, my part uh, about special point data, and then my colleague Eduardo uh, will be talking about point processes. And um, so I start with a little introduction. Um, what do we have? And we are interested basically in, in working with collections of, of points, of some observations. Uh, you may think about trees in the forest. Uh, you may think uh, some positions of the stars. The point is that the, 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 observ the, 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 the idea is the observations are points. And um, we can think about the locations as you know, the, the, the list of, of uh, uh, vectors of length two. So you have um, x and y coordinates. And um, what we want to have in our container for the special you know, point data is not just location, but also the greater observation window. Because the fact that the location exists or locations do not exist is also important. Because you, the, the absence of, of observations is also of importance. So um, the definition uh, for the special point data um, is to provide locations I'm good. Uh, provide the locations, so the list of locations, and provide as the second argument the, the observation window. So here, this is this locations is just a, a sample, random real, um, the the reals are between zero and one, and we look at the window, which is the rectangle, and um, this is spatial point data, which is a constructor and also a container. And there is some information in the elided formula. You see the number of points, you see the dimensions, you see them, you see the region bounds. Um, and because this is the, the rectangle, we got the zero ones. And um, when you expand that, you can, you can you know, get some more information. Um, more information can also be obtained by uh, expanding the properties. This is the list of these properties. Um, I will show some of them, and some of them are self-explanatory, but um, I'll, I'll talk uh, a bit about them later. Uh, so what we can do with special point data, the, 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 I think the main thing people want to do is to plot it. So um, for, for this, for this two-dimensional set, the, the least plot is the good candidate to plot special point data. Uh, we can also put together a region plot with our least plot to plot the observation window with the points. Um, there is also a situation that we don't have specified observation window, and in this case, the, the, there will be an estimated observation region computed uh, when the, the, when the uh, special point data is defined, which is the, the ripley rasson estimate. And this is an example for our locations at the beginning, and this, the, the, this is the region. And so you see that this is one of the uses to access the properties, to check the region, and this is the plot of our original window, which is the, 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 the unit square, the estimated region, and the points within. Uh, we can also define special point data in 3D. Um, I only have here the locations, the three-dimensional locations, and uh, visualized with the least point 3D, and this is the estimated uh, region observation window for this 3D data. Um, we would like to also provide the support for the geo locations because a lot of information is in, in, in coming from maps and geographics. So um, special point data also works, supports geo locations. This is the new function random geo position. So just have 100 random points around the world and we can store them. And you see that right now that um, uh, the, the, the region bounds will correspond um, a bit to the to the latitude and longitude uh, bounds, and the way to visualize that um, right now is to, for example, use geolist plot. It will take the points from the from the spatial point data. Um, another example: uh, this is uh, using um, the information which exists in the Wolfram language the, in the entity framework. I have a country uh, which is Armenia, and I ask for the largest cities, and then I ask for uh, two properties of these largest cities, which is name and position. And um, what I do here, I create special point data, which takes a rule. So I pack all the positions in a single geo position, and then I assign uh, what we call marks. So there are special features of each position, and create the special point data. Uh, the region was estimated, that's the polygon, 
um, on, on, uh, from, the, from the geo positions, but we can also specify a region as the whole country and put this as the observation region. This is the cities two uh, definition. And then the region, as you can see here, this is going to be um, much, uh, the polygon is much more uh, precise um, in that way. Um, so the, the points, um, as, 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 as you see, I actually use the geoposition, but even if you give the list of geopositions, the points will be stored in a compact form of the geoposition. Uh, the geoposition had, so if we want to then do something with the points, we would need to thread this geoposition. And this is an example of um, creating a tooltips where I have on the, on the first uh, the location and then the name. And I, uh, what happened was that we created the spatial point data uh, giving the names, and that can be extracted um, asking for marks, and then give the name of this, of this mark, and then um, use the geo, uh, geo list plot um, with the tooltips, and then you can see that um, each point has a tooltip with the name of the city. Another um, application uh, is to get the information about the nuclear reactors in the world. And that's again from the entity value. And I take two properties here. This is a position and annual energy production. And we create, in a, in a similar way, we create special point data with the geopositions rule goes to marks, which will be the production information. And we have the special point data. Um, the way to, to, to visualize in this case where we have actually a lot of them, the number of points, you see it's 424, would be to use a geohistogram that gives us a better plot um, to, to, to see this. Uh, what we can also do with the special point data is to select uh, f uh, s certain points, um, make a subset, put it that way. And so this is a special point uh, select. And what I want here is to select only the reactors that lie in, 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 in the United States. So I select them by providing um, the region. And I'm going to select by the region. And then what is my region? That's the polygon of the United States. And then um, what, what I use here is a geo bubble chart where uh, that's a location and then a rule that we have the marks that give us the production. And so each bubble will, will tell you the, the number for the, for the production on, the, on the each location for the, of, the, of, the, of the reactors. Okay. Um, another example, this is uh, pre-curated data. It's the, uh, there's some sinkholes and, and springs in, in, in Ozarks. Um, and so we already have the data and would like to know a bit more about this so we can plot. So this is a geolist plot basically on the special point data. But we can also take into account, you know, um, a, a bit more information. So to plot, um, the background is the, the state in which this is. So this is uh, Arkansas and also the observation region. This is this rectangle on top of this, uh, in the north of the state. Uh, one of the properties of the, of the special point data is the mean intensity, which is going to be the number of points divided by the, by the measure of the, of the region. So this is kind of, we know how many karst features we'll have per square mile. Um, the region in this case, that, that was the plotted rectangle, that's the geobounds region. And if we want to know some more uh, about the, how big the region is in terms of, of human units, so miles, you know, kilometers, we can um, kind of extract the corners and then compute geo distance on the, on the corners. So we are talking about, you know, 220 miles across. Um, one of the questions that is being asked in this, uh, you know, point, um, the special point locations analysis is how far, uh, you know, like how far what is the probability to go uh, from one feature to find the next feature, like the closest feature um, in nearby, which is called the nearest neighbor. And uh, this is uh, nearest neighbor G function, which is the, the, the CDF for the nearest neighbor distribution. And we can compute, for example, the, the plot of this. In, so that's the probability to find another feature within you know, one mile or two miles and such. And also using some approximation um, um, of, the, of the, re, the, the integral of the one minus the CDF, we can compute the mean uh, distance from a typical feature to its nearest neighbor, which is 0.76 miles. And um, this is a bit uh, cheating because this is a prototype visualization function, which probably will never exist 
uh, in, in Wolfram language, but it exists now to, to help us to, to plot these features, uh, especially when we don't yet have the proper visualiz visualization function that would do this. And this splits the data because you see the data actually had um, two, two categories. There were, there, there were springs and there were sinkholes, and we kind of didn't talk about that. But um, this plot will, 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 will kind of reveal that, but also the other information, the other way to assess the information is to go to the summary uh, property that will tell us about um, existence of marks. So here the, 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 the mark is the cars feature. And we can, again, use the special point select to um, extract just the sinkholes or just the springs, and we can compare intensities using the geosmooth histogram for them. And um, points. And then brings us to, to the, my, my last slide, which is kind of a bit introduction to the, to the Eduardo's part of the talk, is that um, special point data is also a container for uh, simulation data from the point processes. So uh, we, we introduced some point processes here. I'm, I'm having an example with the Poisson point process of intensity 150 dimension two over a rectangle. And when we uh, simulate that using the random point configuration, we get a special point data, we can plot this. Um, another example is to uh, have a cluster point process. One of such processes is a matter point process. When we have intensity of the clusters, intensity for, for a cluster, um, the radius and also the dimension. And then uh, we uh, also obtain special point data. And that concludes my part. Hi, uh, my name is Eduardo Serna. Um, I've been working with Corsia in, on spatial point data and spatial point processes. We've been doing, we've been putting a lot of work both on the data side and the container side of, of the problem. So what Corsia has been showing, being able to manipulate data, being able to visualize it, uh, being able to extract um, statistics from it. These things are very important. Um, and we've also been putting a lot of work into the modeling side of, of the problem, which is what I'm going to be work, uh, talking about. Great. Um, is that big enough? You never know. Gonna move it a bit bigger. OK. Um, so le let me just motivate why we, I mean, this is an obvious thing, but I think it's worth saying again. Uh, in statistics and in science, we want to model um, data. And for that, we, we use outside knowledge, uh, prior information that we didn't extract from the problem, that, but that where we perhaps have like uh, reasons to believe that there's an underlying mechanism to the problem or something like that. And we, and this enables us to do two things. It enables to make more powerful predictions, and it also en enables us to learn something about the, the underlying mechanism that we're trying to, that we're trying to understand. So it's a two-way process, and that's why modeling is so important. Um, for, Poisson, for point processes, there's uh, many, many types of models. We, it's impossible to, to, to include them all, really. Uh, the, there are large families that we have tried to, to include, but, and there's still some missing that we hope we, we can include, but the, it, this is like a huge space. Uh, the, 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 the stuff we have so far um, f falls into three main families. The, the Poisson family, which are the, uh, where points, the points generated by the process are, are independent from each other. And then we have a very big family of models called we can call interactive models uh, where they're not inter when they're not independent from each other and this can be uh, this can model all types of interactions second order so only pairwise interactions but more complicated stuff. Uh, they, we also, as Gosia showed in her last slide, have um, cluster processes which are uh, a subset of the above because they're interacting processes but they have their own. They, they can be specified in a natural way by specifying the centers of the clusters and then the, the, the cluster generating mechanism. And um, again, there's many more. There's some Cox stochastic processes and, and this, the, it's, it's a never ending thing. May, we have, we have um, some, some general processes that can generate uh, 
large families of these, given they're very, very general. And then we have a more dedicated processes that have dedicated algorithms that are more efficient, but they're less general. Um, so let's talk about the Poisson point process that uh, Gosa introduced. Um, this is the simplest one. Um, and it's in many sense, in many ways, the more the more important one because it's the the one we we compare against uh, when we first encounter data. We this is the one where points are uniformly distributed over the observation region, um, and they're also independent from each other. This last condition, the independence condition, is very important, and it requires that the number of points is not fixed, and in particular, it's. Poisson distributed, but the, the non-fixed is perhaps more important. Uh, if we if the number of points was fixed, like you would get, for instance, using the the function random point in the Wolfram language, um, because the number of points is fixed, different sub the number of points in different subregions would depend on the number of points on other subregions, and by definition, they wouldn't be independent. So that's the reason why we need a pro uh, a process. A, 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 a process which, whose points are fully independent needs to have a non-fixed number of points. Um, as Gossi said, the, it's defined by the intensity, which is the mean number of points per unit of um, measure of the region. And we also specify the dimension here. So in this case, dimension two in the, on the plane, um, we again, this is the same that Gossi did previously, we can specify a region, this time a disk, and we can sample from it, and we can plot it. And this is what a Poisson point process looks like with this type of intensity. Some, this big, we can see these big gaps. We can see that some points are very close to each other. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like. Um, yes? Yes, the intense with the density intensity. There's a, it's a linear transformation. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a thing called a binomial point process that we also have that specifies the number of points. But then, as I said before, that the number of points is not independent. If you look at one, one, um, a one half disk, the number, and we count the number of points, we will know how many points we have on the other side, and that's that's not fully independent. So. So this is why this is the simplest point process. Uh, yeah, that was that was luck. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, the number of points is Poisson distributed times the intensity times the region measure. That's that's how you generate them actually. Um, so although this is a very simple uh, model, it can reasonably model very real-world uh, real data. And um, if we don't have a good reason to believe that the, uh, a point, the data is, has been generated by a more complicated model, this is the right thing to do. You, you don't want to overcomplicate things. You don't want to overfit data. So this is... Um, this here, SP, is, is data that we've, I've taken from one of the curated sets that we have. Um, I plotted. Again, it looks something like this. Uh, notice that it doesn't quite look the same as what I had here. Like, you can visually see that something's not the same. Um, but to a first approximation, um, we can do a spatial randomness test, which is essentially testing our data. Is, a co is distributed according to a Poisson point process of any lambda, of any intensity. Um, and we can see that this test uh, passes, and we can estimate the process, and we get an intensity of 0 0.0069. Um, I'm going to, I'll come back to, to testing in a bit. Um, um, we also have the inhomogeneous Poisson point process, which is a very general object, and uh, it's the older brother of the Poisson point process. Um, and here, post points are independent, but they're not uniformly distributed. Um, this is a very general object that can, uh, in practice, model most types of data, because you can use an arbitrary intensity, including non-parametric estimation. Again, if you don't have uh, 
a good reason to suggest there are interactions of something more complicated going on. This is a, this will will do for your needs. Um, so here an example is I I use this intensity to the intensity, I, and it's very steep. It will it. And we can define the inhomogeneous Poisson point process again with the intensity in the dimension, like we did before the, for the for the homogeneous one. We can sample, and we can show that indeed the density or the intensity of points is heavily skewed to the to the north east north northeast because uh, here the density is grows more quickly in the in the y direction. Um, um, we can also estimate this this intensity neon parametrically. Uh, so we estimate the we're using we have a function called smooth point intensity, but we also have discrete uh, versions of this uh, function that use type, different types of binning. Um, and we and this works. This is a valid intensity that you can put in the process and again sample and it all works perfectly and you'll be use it you'll be able to use it like it was a function or anything um, so here's the plot that shows the 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 contour plots of the in the of the non-parametric intensity the and then this parametric sample that we generated um, above in the non-parametric sample okay I need to rush okay so let's talk about uh, a point process that is slightly more interesting. Uh, this is this is the the simplest perhaps of the interacting processes, and it's called the Hardcore point process. And it's like a Poisson pro point process, but with an with an intensity lambda. But points are not allowed to be closer than a radius r of each other. Uh, so this can model l actually loads of things. Um, this is also a very useful model. You can um, trees. Well, anything that will there will be like an exclusion, uh, a hardcore exclusion between the points, um, and uh, here we we set the hardcore radius to be 0.1. Uh, we sample from it and we compare. Here's a, a plot to compare between the early Poisson point process, the uniform one, the homogeneous one, and the hardcore, and we can see that the that the orange points are never too close to each other. Um, uh, are useful. This is a, something called a Fry plot, which is which computes the points uh, distances between pairs of points, and it's useful to 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 visually uh, determine whether there's a hard core because there'll be like you can see that in the center there's like a kind of perfect circle in the middle, uh, and this is shown, and and this won't happen if it's not like a pure hard core. Um, so, coming back to testing, we, yeah, we, we can see, we can again do a spatial randomness test with these points generated by a hardcore point process, and we can see that the first, that the first test, the default test, um, passes the test, which is, and we know it's not spatially, purely spatial random because we generate it and it's a hardcore point process. So, and this is because this test, the default test is, uh, for now, it's, it's very fast, but it's not, it doesn't have a lot of power. Um, but if we use a more powerful test, um, this is, we call it the Monte Carlo for now. I use Monte Carlo simulation using uh, a more discerning statistic called the Bessagel statistic. Uh, this one's able to very clearly figure out that the p-value for this is zero, and uh, we can tell that it's not fully independent. Um, we can also estimate the parameters for this process. Not, uh, some processes have, are, it's very hard to estimate the parameters for, um, for mathematical reasons of ambiguities. And they're not, the estimation is not well post problem. But for some, we can and we do. Uh, in this case, we estimate that the, indeed, that the hardcore is very close to 0.1, and it has the intensity of 31, which it was 30. Um, we can plot this estimated point process again. The, the, the plot looks the same, looks good. Um, and we can, more importantly, estimate if this, 
check if this estimated model is a good fit for the data that we had. And this is a very powerful test. Um, um, you know, this has a lot of power. If, if it's not, it will quickly give you um, a very, because it's using, again, um, these distance statistics and, and it's using a Monte Carlo simulation. So the fact that um, this is, uh, the fact that this test passes is a very encouraging thing. You found data and your test passes. This is a very encouraging thing that you've, you, you're doing something right, that your model fits the data reasonably well. We can try with a Poisson point process and it, it, won't, it won't be a good fit. We estimate the intensity. The intensity is, is different and the, the, the p-value is, is very small and, and this is rejected at the 5% level. Okay. I need to rush, I need to finish. Um, okay, so let me just uh, give an application uh, using the hot compound process, something fun that you can do is imagine if this was a forest, we, we figured out the, the radius, the hardcore radius before, how much could we pack this forest? Uh, um, so uh, analytical calculations in, in point process are very hard to do, but we, could, we can sample, we can obtain numerical results quite easily. So, so we could say, okay, let's sample, let's keep the hardcore radius the same, crank up the intensity, take loads of samples, and we can get a histogram of the point cloud distribution and the, and the maximum of, of the number of number of trees that we can fit in this region with this with this hardcore constraint. Um, so we we sample a uh, thousand realizations. We this one's the first th this plot the orange one is the plot of the of the first of these realizations for the for the packed case, and we can see that the points still obeying the hardcore constraint, but they're much closer than in the than in the, the previous hardcore sparse case where the intensity was lower. Um, we can take a histogram of the point counts um, and we can see it's kind of like a Gaussian-ish shape um, or Poisson. And we, we can see a maximum that it's reasonable here. It's 182 um, trees. Okay, so I'm gonna finish because we have to finish. Um, to conclude, this is upcoming functionality uh, so, that, so that we'll be able to work with spatial point data and spatial point processes. We leverage um, all the geographical and geometric functionality that's already present in the, fun in the Wolfram language so we can uh, do arbitrary regions. Um, and, you know, this is very important. And that's it. <laughs>